you on this network. And you can join the thousands of Bible Strong partners today. Your dedicated support will help deliver the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. Plus, as a Bible Strong partner, you will receive monthly resources handpicked by Dr. Jeremiah to encourage and strengthen your own walk with God. To become a member or to find out more information, go to davidjeremiah.org forward slash Bible Strong. Does your devotional life need a turning point? David Jeremiah's exclusive monthly magazine and devotional may be what you're looking for. Each issue of Turning Points is centered around a unique spiritual theme based on David Jeremiah's teachings. Inside, you will find inspiring articles from David Jeremiah taken from God's Word. Study inspirational daily devotions to aid you in your quiet time with God. Discover a complete schedule of Turning Points radio and television broadcasts so you never miss a show. Stay up to date with important ministry info so you can stay connected with Turning Point. Learn more information about our live events coming to your city. Join more than 300,000 subscribers who support the ministry of Turning Point around the world. Sign up for your copy of this free monthly resource today.
When we spend every day with Jesus, he opens our eyes to the purpose he has given us in every moment. When we spend every day with Jesus, every day can be an extraordinary day with God. Introducing Dr. David Jeremiah's new 365-day devotional, Every Day with Jesus. Inside this beautiful leather soft volume, you'll find 365 daily inspirational readings from Dr. Jeremiah, paired with selected scripture to challenge and encourage you in your walk with God. Easy to take with you and read wherever and whenever you need to connect with Christ. Every Day with Jesus is yours in appreciation of your gift of any amount in support of this program. This devotional is also a favorite Turning Point resource to share with others. And when you give a generous year-end gift of $120 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will thank you with four copies of Every Day with Jesus, one to keep and three to share with others. Let this daily devotional inspire you in the coming year to live every single day with Jesus, for Jesus, and like Jesus. Request yours from Turning Point today. Thank you for watching Turning Point. Now here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, God is with us. It was 1944 when this happened. The German city in which Dietrich Richel was living was bombed. And thousands of people were killed, and after the bombing stopped, Dietrich was lying on a bench in the railroad station that was serving like a makeshift hospital. And he was looking up through the partially destroyed roof as the fires were burning all over the city. He caught a glimpse of an inscription that was carved into one of the remaining sections that was still intact in the ceiling. And the inscription read as follows, Beyond the stars, there must live a gracious Father. Lying there, looking at that inscription, he thought, I don't want such a God. I do not want a God who is beyond the stars. I need a God who's here. I need a God who's present, a God who's available, a God who knows and understands my situation. And while we understand the transcendence of God and His majesty and His greatness, a God who does not reveal Himself to us is unknowable and ultimately unlovable. And we don't want such a God. Let's be honest. If the only God we have is beyond the stars, up there somewhere where we cannot ever reach or know, he is of no value to us whatsoever. We do not want a God who only dwells beyond the stars. We want a God who dwells with us and who understands what it is like to live as we live here on this earth, especially at times like this. We want someone who understands our pain and our suffering we want a God who is near, and that is what we have in Jesus Christ. That is the wonderful message of Christmas, that God has come into the midst of our suffering to help us face the challenges of life. And the Christmas name for our Lord that reminds us of this wonderful truth is Emmanuel. Say that with me, Emmanuel. And God has written his name only three times in the Scripture. Once in Isaiah 7, 14, where we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. You will also find that name in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 8. And Matthew 1, 23 records a quotation from Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated... God with us. In Matthew's account, the name Emmanuel is given by the angel who was announcing the birth to Joseph. And as you probably noticed, the angel was quoting the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament. The prophecy by Isaiah was given when the southern kingdom of Judah was in a lot of danger. The kings of Syria and Israel had joined forces against Judah, and they were threatening to destroy Jerusalem. At that time, the king of Judah was a man by the name of Ahaz. And on one occasion, Ahaz went out to secure the safety of the city's water supply, and he was met there unexpectedly by Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah assured the king that he didn't need to worry about Syria or Israel, but Ahaz didn't believe him. And so the Lord told the king to ask him for a sign, but the king refused. Isaiah 7:12. Ahaz said, I will not ask nor will I test the Lord. And Isaiah responded to the king saying, 
Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you will also weary my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, there's a lot of history that should be inserted right here, and we don't have time to go into all of that. But let me just remind you that the name for Jesus, Emmanuel, was given to a king at a time when he was afraid for his life and for the life of his people. Have you ever thought deeply about what it means when the Bible says God is with us? There are so many thoughts wrapped up in that idea. It would be impossible to talk about them all in one sermon. It's an idea that only God could have originated, and it's a truth that he could only bring forward himself. One of the men that I have so admired as a pastor from when I was a young pastor to being an older pastor is in heaven now. His name is W. Criswell, and he was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas for many years, a great student of the Word of God. Here's what he wrote about Emmanuel. He said, God is with us. He shares our labors. He knows the dull, drab drudgery of life's common tasks, the heavy misery of back-breaking work. He shares our trials. He shares our limitations. He was poor once with no place to put his head. He was hungry, grateful to the converted women who ministered to him of their substance. He was thirsty, begging water from the Samaritan woman. He was weary and exhausted, and he bore our sorrows and our heartaches. For instance, if there was a death in a home, it brought tears to his eyes. Jesus wept. When he looked upon the cripple, the leper, the blind, the helpless, his heart was moved to compassion. Anybody could approach the Lord Jesus and be welcome, whether they were poor or weak or sinners. God is with us in all love and infinite blessing. God knows what we're going through, and God is with us. It's wonderful to think of that. But perhaps you're thinking, well, that was a great Bible truth. I'm sure the people back in the Bible days really enjoyed that. But does that work for us? The last thing Jesus said before he went back to heaven after his sojourn on this earth was this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Emmanuel's not just a Bible truth. It's a truth for today. It's a truth until Jesus comes back. He is with us always. Let us not forget that Emmanuel is an eternal presence. He's with you. He's with me. I love this name probably more than anything else because I have needed to know this so many times in my life. There's a lot of times in my life when if I, I don't know what to do except to cry out to God. And when you cry out to God, it is so incredibly important to know He is here. He hears us. He knows. Not only does He answer our prayer, He knows what to do about our requests. So God is with us is a really important truth. And I'd like to take just a few minutes today and give you four or five reasons why we should really embrace this truth, especially now. And here's the first one. We need to know that God is with us in our service. You know, serving the Lord is the most wonderful thing you can do. Apart from becoming a Christian, to be called to serve the Lord in some special way is the greatest thing you can ever know. But sometimes even in the serving of the Lord, whether it's in a class or whatever you do, however God uses you, it can become wearisome as well. People who have served and served and served and sometimes your body is just weary and you look up and you got all this stuff to do and you're just tired. And I want to remind you that God has specifically throughout the Old and the New Testament given his promises uniquely and wonderfully and purposefully to people who are involved in serving him. Let's just take, for, for instance, Moses. Moses had that incredible experience with the burning bush. And God called him and said, Moses, I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and I'm slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? That's a good start. Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, Moses. And I love this. And I will be 
with your mouth. I will be with your mouth. Did you ever know anybody that you wish God was with their mouth? Uh, maybe you should suggest this verse to them, that they need to pray this prayer. God, be with my mouth. It'd clean some stuff up, wouldn't it? But God said to Moses, you don't have to worry about what I've called you to do because I'm going to be with you, not just with you personally. You're worried about what you're going to say? I'll be with your mouth. And then, of course, there was Joshua. He was Moses' successor. Joshua was given this incredible assignment to go in and settle the promised land for God's people, and he was afraid. The Canaanites were very vicious people, cruel people. And God said to Joshua, Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many of you know how important it is to know that God is with you? And then there's Jeremiah, one of the great, great personalities of the Bible. Maybe my most favorite personality of the Bible, Jeremiah. I can't understand why. <laughs> the weeping prophet, he's called. One day God called to Jeremiah and told him he was going to give him a role as a prophet. He was to go to speak to his people. And he said, Jeremiah, before you leave, let me tell you how it's going to turn out. Nobody's going to listen to you and nobody's going to do what you say. Well, I mean, what an assignment. I think if, if God had called this Jeremiah like he called that Jeremiah, I probably wouldn't be here today. I mean, who wants to do that? But then God said to Jeremiah, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. I'm just trying to make the point today, men and women, that when we go to serve the Lord, whatever it may be, in some formal position or some informal everyday situation, we're all servants of the Lord. When we serve the Lord, God has promised that he goes with us. We don't have to do this by ourselves. And frankly, if you try to pull this off on your own, you're going to be very tired, discouraged, and frustrated. But when you have God as your partner and you go together and God is with you, it is a wonderful thing. In late January of 1956, Dr. Martin Luther King received a threatening phone call at his house. He was in the midst of all of the battles that he was fighting for the freedom of his people. It was not the first bad message he'd received, but on this night as his children and his wife lay sleeping, the weight of the civil rights movement was too heavy. He decided that the risk was too great and he began to map out an exit strategy. At midnight, he bowed his head over the kitchen table and according to him, this is what he said. He said, God, I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they will fail. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I cannot face it alone. Martin Luther King Jr. said in a moment that he can never forget, I experienced the presence of God in my life. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of the inner voice saying this, Martin, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. And I wonder if that's not a message we should know in our day today. There's so much is going wrong, so much is south, so much is beneath the, the surface, and we all know in our hearts there's something just not right. And the God of Martin Luther King says to us, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be with you forever. God is with us when we serve him. And secondly, God is also with us in our struggles. We have at least two things that bind us together as Christians. Let me tell you what they are. First of all, we're all in the body of Christ. We're all in the same. You may not like it. You may not think you should be in the same family with somebody. But if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ, you're a part of God's forever family. We all have that in common. But here's the other thing we have in common. We all have problems. There's no such thing as getting from the cradle to the grave or from the cross to the grave without problems. The Bible doesn't tell us if you become a Christian, all your problems will go away. Most of us discovered when we became Christians, we got some problems we didn't have before. We got some new problems. Everybody has problems, but in the group of people who have problems, there are two kinds of people. People who admit they have problems and people who don't. And if you don't admit you have problems, you got a problem. <laughs> Friends, if you don't admit your struggles, 
you don't have any way of getting help. God isn't going to swoop in and save you from your problems until you come and acknowledge that you have them. And the Bible says that he is always here for us when we're going through stuff. <laughs> Here's what it says in Hebrews 13. He himself has said, Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what can man do to me. Or Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And if you don't know this one, write this down in your notebook. Here it is. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not. For I am with you. Be not afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's who God is. That's what God does. He has come to help us in our struggles. Sometimes when we're going through stuff, we think God has left us. And we only think that because we're hurting so much. We don't know how to look around and find him. But I promise you, he's there. He's there with you in the midst of all of this. And when you don't know what to do, you know who you talk to. You know that God is there. He is with us in our service. He is with us in our struggles. He's with us in our sorrow. When you have God with you, it doesn't make the sorrow go away. I mean, a lot of people think if you become a Christian, your problems are reduced. And I've already said that isn't true. When you become a Christian, you don't lose your sorrow. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says you sorrow not as others who have no hope. If you have a Christian sorrow, it's not despair. It's sadness. I mean, who isn't sad when you no longer have the opportunity to interact with somebody that you love, someone in your family, a grandparent, a parent, a child uh, goes to heaven unexpectedly or in due time and sorrow comes. But God is with us in our sorrow. He draws near to those who are hurting. That's what the Bible says. Especially when you're hurting, God draws near to you. Isaiah says it this way, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. <laughs> And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. When Jesus went back to heaven, the last thing he said to his disciples, I know you're upset and you don't know what's going to come next, but here's what I want to tell you. When I go back to heaven, I'm going to send somebody in my place. He called him another comforter. Jesus was the first comforter, and he's going to send him another comforter. So when Jesus went back to heaven, he dispatched 40 days later the Holy Spirit into this world. And the Holy Spirit came to be with us. The Holy Spirit now is God with us. And the Holy Spirit is, in many respects, better than if Jesus had remained on this earth. Let me tell you why. If you study the life of Jesus when he was on this earth, he helped people because they came to him. Jesus was localized. He lived out his whole ministry in a very small country the size of Vermont, would you believe? He never went outside the borders. So if you needed Jesus to help you, you had to go where Jesus was. And that limited his ability to help everyone. So when he went back to heaven, he put in plan B, the second part of this, and he sent his Holy Spirit, and guess what? The Holy Spirit lives within every person who has put their trust in Jesus Christ. When you ask Christ to come and live within your heart, he comes to live within your heart, and the Spirit of Jesus comes to live within you as well. So the Holy Spirit fills everyone. So Jesus isn't in Palestine. Jesus isn't in Israel. Jesus is in you. He's in you and you. He's in your heart. He's with you. So when you go through these issues, you don't have to go somewhere to get help. The someone who gives you help is within you himself. He is with you. He is the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, when you're feeling alone, you're not. If you're a Christian, you are never alone. And that's why Christians say this to me. When I was going through that, Pastor, I never felt the presence of God like I did during that time. 
When everyone else is gone, God draws near and makes his presence known. And that is the wonderful truth of Emmanuel. And then God is with us in our stumbling, in our sinfulness. You say, well, I've sinned. God's gone. I messed up. I won't see God again. No, God doesn't leave you when you sin. That is both an encouragement and a conviction at the same time. You may think that if you do this, God will leave you alone. But if you're a Christian, he's not going to leave you alone. The Bible says that Christmas is about something very special, the forgiveness of sin. She will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Why did Jesus come to this earth as a baby, be born into human flesh, and walk among us for all these years without sin, and go to the cross, hang between two thieves, give up his life, he did it because that was the only way that we could ever know God. Our sin had to be paid for, and the only one who could pay for it was someone who was like us and someone who was God. And so Jesus came, and he took that upon himself and paid the penalty for all our sin. First John 4, 9 and 10 says it this way, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the satisfaction of for our sin. That's what the word propitiation means. So when we mess up, when we do things we shouldn't do, don't get the idea that when you do that, God leaves you. He doesn't leave you. He may discomfort you. He may come after you. He may give you a bad time until you get right, but he doesn't leave you. He never leaves you. A few years ago, someone gave me a book called America's Least Competent Criminals. It's got to be the funniest book I have in my library in many respects. For instance, in 1989 in Lakeland, Florida, four teenage delinquents decided to steal a car from a shopping mall. So they go to the shopping mall and they try to pick a car that they want to steal. And they had stolen cars before, but in the middle of the shopping mall, they see a van and they'd never stolen a van before. So they think they're going to go for the big bucks and steal themselves a van. They're going to steal this van, so they jimmy the lock in the van. They crawl in where they find four undercover police officers who are trying to figure out who was stealing all the cars from the mall. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful story? Here's the one that's even better. In 1989 in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, this guy is arrested on suspicion of being a criminal who's breaking into all the vending machines all over town and stealing all the money. And nobody can prove that it's him. They think they know it's him, but there's no cameras, and they, no one has caught him in the act. But he gets in a lot of trouble, and they bring him before the judge for an arraignment. And the judge was pretty convinced that he did it, but lacking any significant proof, they decided to let him go on bond. They set his bond at 400 dollars and the guy opened his backpack and paid for the bond in quarters <laughs> and we laugh and say who are they kidding thinking they're getting by with all this but before you indict these guys let me tell you something and I don't want this to be a down moment but I want it to be a truth moment everything you have done that you shouldn't have done this week you did it in the sight of Almighty God in his presence we think we're so smart. We think we get by with stuff. We think we can do things that are wrong and nobody will ever find out. But let me give you the distilled wisdom of being a pastor for 50 years. I've watched this over the years. Here's what I've learned. Nobody gets away with it. Nobody. Ever gets away with it. The Bible says it this way. Be sure your sin will find you out. <laughs> Be sure your sin will find you out. I put the scripture on the, on the screen. You might want to write that one down. You may have a seven-year fuse. You may have done something seven years ago. You think you finally got past it, you beat it. But you better not relax because be sure your sin will find you out. Just think what it does to your relationship when you sin and you don't deal with it. Just think of the stain it puts on your relationship with God. Let me give you a little illustration. This comes out of having also been a father of four kids, and nothing like what I'm going to tell you has ever happened in my family, but I understand all this. There was this young man who was told by his father not to go to a party 
because his father knew that something was going on at that party that he didn't want his son to be involved in. Okay, Dad, I won't go. But when he left the house, he began to realize that all of his buddies were at the party. So he goes to the party. Unfortunately for him, someone at the party calls his father and said, did you know that your son was at this party? Worst thing that can ever happen to a kid. And his father said, no, but I'll take care of it. So his boy comes home and his father says to him, well, what'd you do tonight? Well, dad, I went bowling. Well, you've been gone a long time, son. Well, there was a long line at the bowling alley. How'd you do? I did good. What did you bowl? Now, I could go on with that interchange, but let me just stop the story right there and ask you this question. You're the father. At this particular moment, what is most upsetting to you? The fact that your son went to a party that you told him not to go to or the fact that he's lying to you about what he did? And if you're a parent, I don't even ask for a vote. You know what the answer to that is. So let me ask you this question, friends. Do you think our Father in Heaven is any different than that? Isn't that an interesting thought? Do you think when we stumble and fall, He wants us to go trying to cover it up when we know that He knows everything that we've done? Don't you think He would be more blessed if we would just come and say, please forgive me. I did wrong. I acknowledge my sin. Let me ask you, go back to the story for a moment. Suppose that nothing is said on the part of the father after that confrontation, and nothing is said on the part of the son. What kind of relationship do you think you have in that family? When the father knows you lied to him, you know you lied to him, and nobody's talking about it. You see, the only way you can make that right, the only way you can clean that up, is to confess. And that's what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And what's out? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, like any human father longs for reconciliation when something is wrong in the family, so our Emmanuel longs for reconciliation from those who have stumbled and walked away from him. God loves you. He's going to be with you no matter what you do. But if you have failed him, don't try to cover it up. Can you, can you just stop for a moment and think of the absurdity of trying to hide something from God who knows the very heart of heart, the intention that was there before anything ever happened. So just acknowledge it, get it right. And God says he will forgive you and restore you and you can go on with your relationship with him. Finally, God is with us in his searching. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to this earth to seek and to save that which is lost. God is with us to save us. He came into this world for one purpose, that he might bring many sons to glory. I like to say it this way. Don't forget this. God is with us so that one day we can be with him. God came here to save us from our sin and make us heaven ready so that when we die, we can go to be with him forever. That's what he said to his disciples when they were so discouraged. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that, listen to this, where I am, there you may be also. That's the whole key to his coming to this earth, that where he is, we may be also. He wants us to be in heaven. He wants you to be in heaven. He came down here. He was born as a baby, became part of humanity. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us so that one day we can be with him. Are you ready to be with God? Have you put your trust in him? Have you trusted him as your savior? You see, that's the whole meaning of Christmas. If we don't get it right, we miss the whole deal. Christmas is the greatest salvation story in all of the schedule of the year. Christmas is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I want to ask you today, if you haven't trusted him as your savior, will you do it? Will you allow the ministry of our music, the ministry of the word of God, the scriptures, the reminder again from the Bible that God loves you 
and he sent his son to save you. Will you accept him as your savior? I want to show you a verse that I probably have read this many times, but I never saw it like I saw it this week. Here it is. This is the whole message I've preached today in one verse. It's Deuteronomy 31.8. Here's what it says. The Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So do not fear and do not be dismayed. Wow. That's when you put on the dashboard in your car, up on your mirror, by your bed, and then you will know that the Lord is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Dr. Jeremiah will return to close today's program right after this. Thank you for watching Turning Point. When you support this program with a gift of any amount, Dr. Jeremiah would like to thank you by sending you Every Day with Jesus, his new 365-day devotional for 2022. Inside this beautiful leather soft volume, you'll find 365 daily inspirational readings from Dr. Jeremiah, paired with selected scripture to challenge and encourage you in your walk with God. This devotional is also perfect for sharing with others. And with a generous year-end gift of $120 or more in support of this program, you'll receive a four-pack of Every Day with Jesus so that you can give your loved ones a copy and help them discover Christ's presence in their life as well. Your support helps this program continue on this station and keeps the ministry on firm financial footing into the new year. Contact Turning Point today. And now, with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. It is one thing to say, God is with us at Christmas time, but there's a question we have to ask. Is God with me? Yes, he's with the whole world as he superintends his creation. I was looking for a way to help people simply understand the eternal nature of God's love, that it began before they did and exist. God loves you now, but here's some better news. He always has loved you, even before you were born, even before the world was born. He has loved you from the very foundation of time. Before the world began, he set his love upon you and upon me. Let me tell you what the Bible says about God's relationship with you before you were ever born. If you have your Bible open to Psalm 139, let me read verses 15 and 16 of that Psalm. Here is David speaking. He is saying, my frame, O Lord, was not hidden from you, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. These verses tell us that before you were born, God knew your identity. David uses the term me to refer to himself before he was born. It is important to note that in verse 16, you have the only word in the Hebrew Bible for the word embryo. It's the word that's translated by these words, being yet unformed. As God was forming you, as he was forming me, he was loving you. With his unmatched poetic eloquence, the psalmist David writes about this father who knits us together in the womb, numbering the hairs on our heads as well as the days of our lives. We also learn that in his infinite wisdom and power, even as God designs us for our days, he designs our days for us, writing them in his book before any of them come to pass. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, God spoke these words to his prophet. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, God says, I knew you. God knew our identity before we were born, before we were ever formed. God loved us before we were born.
Not only does he know our identity, but these passages we're reading in Psalm 139 teach us that before we were born, God knew our complexity. Notice verses 13 and 14 in this psalm. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. This is the work of our creator God, who has put us together in the words of David, fearfully and wonderfully. The human body, which is studied now more than ever before, is the most marvelous organism that ever has been or ever will be. Back in 2010, there was a presentation entitled Conception to Birth, Visualized. It was produced by Alexander Siaris, a mathematician, chief of scientific visualization at Yale. He shared some of the most incredible images of a child's development in the womb. As you watch the video, you could literally see never before images like the first cell division, the development of the heart at only 25 days, the development of arms and hands at only 32 days, the development of retina, nose, eyes at 52 days. Clearly blown away by what he has seen in his work, which by the way won him the Nobel Prize. Sierris concluded his talk with these words. He said, the complexity of these things, the mathematical model of how these things are indeed done are beyond human comprehension. Even though I am a mathematician, I look at this with the marvel of how did these instruction sets build that which is us. And then he thought, it's a mystery, it's magic, it's divinity. He got it right the third time. Our creator, men and women, is an artist of infinite majesty. He is a craftsman of breathtaking detail. And all that he does is driven and guided by his infinite love for you and for me. Before you were born, God knew your identity. Before you were born, he knew your complexity. And before you were born, he knew your individuality. Notice what it says in verse 16 of Psalm 139. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Here we strike a blow to those who want us to believe that there is no such thing as an individual person in the womb. God creates us. You say, no, God had nothing to do with it. Yes, he has everything to do with it. Before you were formed, in the womb of your mother, God saw you, he loved you, he knew you. And science strongly supports the idea of genuine life in the womb. Listen carefully, this is very important information for where we are in our culture today. Professor Micheline Matthews Roth of Harvard University Medical School says, it is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception. Dr. Watson Bowes of the University of Colorado Medical School has stated, the beginning of a single human life is from biological point of view a simple and straightforward matter. The beginning is conception. In fact, you see physicians and biologists and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being a being that is alive and is a member of the human species, there is overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. The scientific evidence is overwhelming, but once again, if you consider the place of God in this, the argument is settled with absolute authority. God loved you before you ever were made. He loved you as he prepared you for this world in the beauty of human pregnancy. And all along, he had a life and a purpose prepared. 
just for you. You say, that's so hard for me to comprehend, Pastor, because I feel so insignificant in this world, and there are so many people, and you're saying God actually knew me and cares about me. If, if, you, if you struggle with that, you should, because we all do. But the only reason we struggle with that is because we cannot wrap our arms and our minds around the magnificence of Almighty God, who is so infinite and so majestic that it is possible for him to know you and love you and care about you as if you were the only person for him to care about. We know nothing about that, our capacity to love. I remember when our first grandchild was born, I loved him so much and I said to Donna, I don't think we can have any more because there's no love left in my heart. I've given it all to this one. And then we've had more. (laughs) And you know what? Your love multiplies with the children, doesn't it? You love them all in a separate way. But God loves all of us with a love far more magnificent than the love I had for David Todd when he was born or for my own children when they were born. He loves us individually. He loves us magnificently. He loves us knowingly. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 tells us that not only does he know our identity and our complexity and our individuality, but he knows our destiny. Notice what he says in verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And I wrote down in my Bible from that little verse that God said four things in that one verse. He said, I formed you, I knew you, I sanctified you, and I ordained you. Jeremiah, before he was ever a being, before he was ever formed, God knew him. Before he was ever born, God sanctified him. Before he ever came out of the womb, God had already determined that he was going to be his prophet, just as he did with Jeremiah. God treasures the moments in which he sees us grow and become closer to the people he has designed us to be. For God has a plan for your life and for mine. It predates our birth. It predates uh, our actual being formed in the womb. God created us for a special purpose. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're so hell-bent on finding out what it is. Uh, The question I'm asked more than any other question as a pastor is, how can I know the will of God for my life? In other words, how can I figure out what it is that God planned for me to do? We try to make this thing so complicated, and we jump over the most simple thing of all, and that is God is not going to reveal his path to you until you come to the place where you say, Lord God, I'm willing to do what you've created me to do. And then watch out, (laughs) because I want to tell you something that I've discovered. God's plan for you from eternity past is greater than anything you could ever think up for yourself. He has a plan for your life that is greater than any plan you could give for yourself. Before you were born, God knew your identity. Before you were born, God knew your complexity. Before you were born, God knew your individuality. Before you were born, God knew your destiny. And before you were born, God knew your possibility. Back in the book of Genesis, when the whole creative process began and we get to the creation of humanity, I want you to read these verses with me. Let's read them together off the screen. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible says that we are created in the image of God. Warren Wiersbe once wrote that there was a divine conference before the world began between the members of the Trinity as to how man should be. And they decided together in conference with one another that man should be created after the image of God. Now, when we think about that in human terms, we say, okay, he looks like his father. And we compare physical traits with the physical traits of the father. But of course, as you know, Almighty God doesn't have a physical being. God is a spirit. So what in the world does it mean that we have been created in the image of Almighty God? It means that we bear his character, his nature. 
We are made as a special reflection of who God is. We are constantly echoing his identity in a smaller way. When we work, for instance, it reflects God's work. When we love, it reflects how God loves us. And everything that we do in our lives as humans reflects some part of who God is. When we have dominion over the earth, we reflect God's dominion over the earth. And that is why we feel guilt and why we feel love, why we feel genuine and complex emotions. As flawed as we are, we are the image and glory of the Father. And that's also why until we get in sync with him, until we get connected with him, we can never ever feel like we're the people we ought to be. So many have said that God created us with a God-shaped vacuum in our heart. And until we put God in the proper place in our life, this image of God in us is flawed and broken and it can't ever be realized. That's why there's such a hunger and a thirst and a craving after meaning in our world today. Why people fill their lives with drugs and alcohol and promiscuity and popularity and all the things that you see rampant around us. They're trying to find some way to fill up the ache in the hole in their heart. And the only one who can ever do that is the God who made them in his own image. He's the only one. And the only way you can connect with that God is through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sin and for mine. That's how God feels about you and me. Looking through the window of time. Oh. As I look back over my life, I have a mental picture of every house or apartment that I have ever lived in. Beginning with the house my parents lived in when I was born in Toledo, Ohio, to my present location in El Cajon, California, I can picture every single one of those places. Altogether, I have lived in 15 different homes, and I can recall something special about each one. They were more than just dwelling places. These were centers of activity and personal interaction, not just between the members of our family, but all the people that came and went and all the friends that we have that have been in those homes, the people that we have loved and wanted to be with have been in those houses, and for that reason, they're sacred to us. When my siblings and I became adults and we began our own journeys in life, obviously we moved out of our parents' house, but we never stopped going back. In fact, at Christmas and during vacation days, we would find our way back home. When Don and I were in Dallas, Texas, and I was a graduate student at Dallas Seminary, on at least three occasions that we can remember, we would come home from work on Friday night and look at each other and say, let's go home. And we'd get in our car. At that time, I had a white Chevrolet convertible with a red top. And uh, we'd get in that car and we drive from Dallas, Texas to Cedarville, Ohio. But I remember it's 1,051 miles one way. And we drive there straight through so we could spend about eight hours at home and then get in the same car and drive back so we didn't miss class or work on Monday. You say, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's crazy, but it illustrates the fact that home is like a magnet. If you have a home, you want to go home as much as you can. And we were homesick. We wanted to go home. Well, the Bible tells us that we all have at least one more move. Did you know that? One more house to live in that we haven't lived in yet. Uh, and we don't know when that's going to happen, but the Bible says one day we're going to go to heaven. And uh, in John 14, my favorite name for heaven is listed. You know what it is? Here it is. It's called the Father's house. That's the name for heaven in John 14. Say that with me. The Father's house. That's where we're going to go. One of these days, we're going to move in to the Father's house. This picture of heaven as the Father's house is given to us to remind us that one day soon we're going to be with the one we love and the ones that we love in the Father's house. How many of you know that when you love somebody, you want to be with them? Have you noticed when a couple falls in love, they're inseparable? That's how it works. When you love somebody, you want to be with them. Amen? Amen. And here's the incredible news. God says he wants to be with us. He wants us to be with him. 
In fact, if you go through the New Testament, you will see this little phrase salted into the language of the New Testament over and over again. For instance, in that passage in John 14, I mentioned uh, the end of the verse says that Jesus is preparing this house so that where he is, there we may be also. Have you ever noticed that? He wants us to be where he's going to be. John 17, 24, Jesus in his high priestly prayer prays this, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Jesus wants us to be with him. When he gave his assurance to the thief on the cross, do you remember what he said to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. How many of you know God wants us to be with him? Jesus wants us to be with him. Paul explained it in his own death, and he said this, we are confident, yes, we're pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. When he wrote to the Philippians, he said, I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You see how this keeps reoccurring over and over? God wants us to be with him. And after he teaches us about the rapture, at the end of the verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, he gives us this little caveat, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Heaven is real, and our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are there, and they're making things ready for our eternal home. I often tell people, can you imagine how beautiful heaven is going to be? The Lord Jesus spent six days creating the earth as we see it now. He's been working on heaven for how many years? It's going to be quite a fantastic place. So since he wants us to be with him where he is, let me tell you a little bit about that place. First of all, heaven is the ultimate residence. It's the place of ultimate residence. In the Bible, we're told in John chapter 14 that in this place are many mansions. I read about a law firm that sent flowers to an associate in another city. They were celebrating the opening of a new office. And through some mix-up, the card that accompanied the floral piece read, Deepest Sympathy. When the florist was informed of his mistake, he let out a cry of alarm. Good heavens, he said. The card that went with the flowers to the funeral home said, Congratulations on your new location. (laughs) That's the point I want to make. We have a new location, don't we? Almighty God has provided a new location for us. It's the ultimate residence. This ultimate residence is also a place of ultimate rejoicing. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Bible says that in heaven there's fullness of joy. There's the path of life. And there is pleasure forevermore. Heaven is going to be a pleasurable place. Let me put it down where you can grab it. Heaven's going to be fun. Huckleberry Finn didn't think so. In the opening chapter of Mark Twain's classic, uh, 